Hey guys, welcome to Boxing Squared for Boxing News and Views from around the internet. And another best of the week. So strap in, this one is going to be a longer video. So a number of things in the past week that I wanted to touch on, different goings on, fight announcements. There is actually quite a few fight announcements, but maybe not some of the bigger announcements that we're hoping for. But probably in terms of announcement wise, and this is not a fight announcement, uh, Alexander Usyk, big news of the week that he has signed on with the Skill Challenge Promotions, which is out of Saudi Arabia. So the deal was formally announced, and I guess in terms of what this means for Alexander Usyk, uh, is that he is going to be tied and tethered to the Saudi Skill Challenge Promotions for his fights after the Daniel Dubois fight. So that is a mandatory fight with Dubois. So I guess they're ex expecting that he is going to win. And then he is going to be a big player for their cards that they're looking to hold. There has been that talk of the tournament for the end of the year. But when you consider that Alexander Usyk is now going to be facing Daniel Dubois at the back end of August. So that was something else that was announced in the past week. That the date has moved to August the 26th to be closer to Ukrainian Independence Day. So you've got the situation that fight moving out a week or two and this talk of a fight at the end of the year in December in Saudi Arabia, this tournament, the tournament that they want to hold, where they're saying that Tyson Fury is the holdout, that he wants more money, that he is the one that hasn't come to the table and hasn't accepted an offer. But even in spite of all that, is it just going to be feasible to have it in December just for the fact that, um, you know, both Tyson Fury and Alexander Usyk look to be fighting around August, September. So there's not a lot of leeway between September and then December. And let's face it. All of these guys basically have been fighting once a year, these big name fighters. And if they get two fights in, we're lucky. But for them to have two fights in a year, it generally has to be one is in the first half of the year and then one is in the back end of the second half of the year. So I'm starting to get a little bit skeptical about whether this tournament is, go tournament is going to happen at all. But I mean, there is talk from Tyson Fury's side that they do want him to be part of that. But from what we're hearing from the other potential players who would be part of it Joshua Wilder and Usyk and especially Usyk is saying that Fury doesn't want to be in it but um yeah he will be fighting Alexander Usyk August the 26th then imagine if he got knocked off his perch by Daniel Dubois what would that what impact would that that have with the Saudis potentially they've got some sort of out I would imagine built into the contract but if they can get him into a big fight card in Saudi Arabia well they will be able to make some um, good headlines and hopefully it's a good big fight that we want to see so we'll see what happens there but uh, he is now tethered to them and remember he's also with K2 so this is now he's co-promoted by the Saudis and in terms of the uh, the skills uh, challenge and signing on, Usyk had said it's a great honor, a great opportunity to bring to the fans the biggest fight in heavyweight boxing history. This is the one fight that everyone on the planet wants, and that's referring to Tyson Fury. I guess we'll see if that happens. And Amir Abdallah, the CEO of the Skill Challenge, he had previously confirmed that um, they had plans to stage two heavyweight fights on the same show in December in Saudi Arabia. And it's uh, Fury Usyk, the aforementioned fighters, and uh, Anthony Joshua versus Deontay Wilder. So we'll see what happens there. In terms of um, Deontay Wilder, he's actually called out Alexander Usyk, and he says that um, Usyk is a little afraid of fighting him. And I guess for some, they will say, look, Deontay Wilder has a bad habit of once someone is locked into a fight, he'll start mentioning their name, which he has in this instance also done with Alexander Usyk, because uh, what, 10 days or so ago, there was the purse bid with uh, Daniel Dubois and Usyk's team winning it. And that fight will be held, I believe it's going to be Poland, and that will be what they're talking August the 26th. But in terms of a fight with Alexander Usyk, Deontay Wilder says, I'm all for it. He's a little afraid, not a little afraid, but a lot of fr uh, afraid. I'm in the business, so I know a lot of things. I'm ready to go any moment of time, place, no matter what it is. They know that I'm simple. Deontay Wilder statements. 
And yet it does appear that the only fight Deontay Wilder will have this year is going to be at the end of the year as part of that tournament looking to face Anthony Joshua. So, I mean, at this stage of his career, I mean, a lot of the statements of these fighters, you know, you've got to take with a pinch of salt too. Deontay Wilder will take any of these fights, I'm sure, but saying he want, he's afraid of me and all this sort of stuff, he is just trying to uh, talk things up, embolden his fan base, and uh, make it look like he wants the fight. And I'm sure if it was there, he would take it. But at this moment, Alexander Usyk is obviously looking to uh, try to be undisputed after the fight with Daniel Dubois. Whether he'll get the opportunity, we shall see. Deontay Wilder, um, I think at this stage of his career, he's also just looking to cash out. He wants the big fights, and this is why he's walked away from that number one um, eliminator with uh, Andy Ruiz Jr. for the WBC. It's interesting the WBC hasn't done anything about that, hasn't sort of uh, because they ordered it. But Wilder said, no, I'm not interested in that. I want to make the biggest and best fights. And clearly that also means the biggest purses too. He doesn't want that sort of three, five, ten million dollar purse. He wants those tens of millions of dollars purses for the fights with guys like Joshua, Fury and Usyk. And they're talking $38 million potentially for Wilder versus Joshua. So you can kind of see why he would want to protect that and that for his to, to be his only fight this year. But to say that he will fight anyone on a moment's notice, well, I'm sure it would have to come with a big bag of money as well. And one thing that was really good to see this week, and I know not everyone's going to be thrilled with it, but the whole Joshua and Fury talk, which bubbled up when Tyson Fury came out publicly saying that an offer had been sent, or he actually said a contract, um, but it ultimately ended up being that some talk, uh, talks were relaunched from his side with Anthony Joshua's people. And ultimately, um, pretty early on, you heard from Eddie Hearn that, look, Joshua is going to go his own way. He's looking at a fight for August and then looking at Deontay Wilder for the end of the year. And some people may come out and say, oh, Joshua's ducked him. But I think the reality is, if you've been a fan for any length of time and you're looking at the scenarios and the situations, I mean, just calling out someone's um, name doesn't mean the fight is going to get made. And we've been here, done that, got the postcard with these guys so many times before, and it's boring at this point. So the fact that uh, this was nipped in the bud basically less than a week after it was sort of mooted by Fury. I was kind of happy with that because who wants to see this uh, stuff dragged out for month, weeks or months and then nothing happens because, you know, look, long-suffering boxing fans are sick of that. I think we maybe they will fight at some point, but it'll be when they're well past their best and it'll be a cash out at some point. At this stage, I think Fury wants to throw it out. He knows what Josh was looking to do. He just wanted to throw that out there because I think he wants it to be seen as he was looking to make the fight and Joshua and his team didn't want it. So, I mean, we've seen that before. You know, it hasn't come off. So I was kind of glad that, at least for now, we can put it to the side and go, we don't have to talk about it, we don't have to worry about it, and if it happens at some point, it happens, but these two have had plenty of opportunities to fight. So, you know, for me at least, I thought, well, at least we don't have to go over it for weeks on end ad nauseum. And actually, someone else who's calling out um, Tyson Fury is Francis Ngannou, who said on social media, anyway, I'll be ready, Tyson Fury. And then Tyson Fury followed up on his social media saying, I'll have 15 pints and still KO you big stiff tramp. So Fury, with his recent outbursts and uh, musings on social media, has been uh, calling out Joshua, calling out Nganu, calling out all sorts of names, you know, potentially Dempsey McKean, Jai Opatia, John Jones. And Francis Nganu has been seeking this fight you know, what, for the better part of a year or more, there's been talk about it. I mean, let's face it, though, it would be a circus sort of fight. Fury would probably only fight Nganu if he had a serious name or two, you know, after crossing over from um, MMA. But the thing is, he doesn't. And do I think it's going to happen? Probably not. But it keeps Fury's name out there. And that's all part of what he wants. And Eddie Hearn, the matchroom promoter, he's got a potential opponent for Fury. He wants Fury to face Philip Hergovich. He says, say you're playing a matchmaker for Tyson Fury and you look at the rankings. Imagine AJ fights Dillian White and Wilder and Usyk fights Dubois. I'll tell you if he wants, he can fight Philip Hergovich. Tyson Fury is smart. He doesn't want a risky fight. 
Hergovic is mandatory for the IBF, but Tyson will say, I'm not fighting him. Nobody's heard of Hergovic, but there will always be a line. I think the reality is, no um, disrespect to Philip Hergovic, he's not in that conversation to face Tyson Fury. And part of that is also the way that he's been managed and promoted by uh, Wasserman and also co-promoted by Matchroom. They haven't done him a good service in recent years. They've kept him largely inactive, haven't been able to get him the sort of fights that he needs to build his name as profile to the point where he could be in the conversation for a fight with Tyson Fury. He's a good fighter, but also at this point, I mean, Fury is looking at bigger names. And if he takes a fight, you know, ahead of a big fight, He's going to cherry pick someone that's not going to represent a risk to him. I think he beats Hergovic, but the thing is, Hergovic is a big puncher, so you never know. Tyson Fury is uh, probably, if he drops down to face someone, it'll be a cherry pick. It'll be on the promise of a big fight to come, because let's let's face it, Tyson Fury's got form for that, and he does it. Someone else who's calling out uh, Tyson Fury is Jarrell Big Pharmacy Miller. So he says, to my dear brother Tyson Fury, you know, I love you, but it's about time I put a beating on that ass. I know you're looking for an opponent. Stop looking for scallywags. No more excuses and fight El Grande Jefe Big Baby. We'll gladly fry your fish and chips. Somebody's O has got to go. So Miller, he's on the comeback. He's trying to build uh, his name back up after multiple infractions on the uh, PED front. Will he get a fight with Tyson Fury? Unlikely. Fury had been um, had Miller into his camp what, in the last year or so, but uh, is he likely to face Miller? I wouldn't have thought so, but certainly the trash talk would be epic in the build-up. Little bit of an embarrassing situation this week when, and you might have heard um, Eddie Hearn and just a piece that I was uh, talking about before, mentioned a potential fight for Anthony Joshua versus Dillian White. Yet the problem was no one told Anthony Joshua. So Eddie Hearn was talking about it and then Joshua said, I don't know about any talks to fight Dillian White. Every day, AJ this, AJ that, AJ's hairline's going way back, but I'll still your girl and go retweet that. And that actually was de- deleted relatively quickly. Uh, and then Dillian White, he responded saying, how about you stop being a b- and let's make the fight, you f- weird guy, talking, tweeting stuff, then deleting, be a man, little at Anthony Joshua. And perhaps there has been some initial discussions. Let's face it, Eddie Hearn has been a longtime collaborator with Dillian White. There's been a lot of talk about a fight between Joshua and White from Eddie Hearn as well. But apparently Anthony Joshua has been left out of the loop. Perhaps there has been some discussions between Hearn and also um, Joshua's management 258. I mean, not sure what's happening, but that was kind of uh, a bit of a facepalm type thing, uh, considering Hearn had been talking about Anthony Joshua versus Dillian White for the next few months. And if that fight does happen, I think at this stage, White's pretty washed. I would pick Joshua to win and by stoppage. Robert Hellenius, the uh, the talk of retirement is just that. So he will be returning in Finland in a couple of months. So he will be facing a 41-year-old Mika Milinen who's 6-0, and and that's the headliner of a show in Savonlina, Finland. Probably butchered that. But uh, yeah, there was a lot of talk and speculation, and even Hellenius fed into it after his loss to Deontay Wilder that he was going to hang it up. And there was some reporting in Scandinavia saying that he had retired. But um, I guess a lot of these fighters, you know, even at 39 years old, Robert Hellenius probably thinks, look after a break, and if I can uh, string together a couple of wins, I can make a final run. After all, a lot of these guys too, what do they do after boxing? Sometimes um, the thought of delaying the inevitable keeps them going. David Adlai has uh, had his opponent for June the 9th confirmed. He will be facing Amir Amatovic. And I thought, man, that name seems familiar. And it is because he faced Philip Hergovic a couple of years back and he was stopped in three rounds and Hergovic dropped him multiple times. But before I recorded this video, I specifically went back to watch that fight because I couldn't really remember much of it, except I thought there was multiple knockdowns and there was. But Amatovic, pretty basic, not a lot of power, but he was game. He was looking to throw punches and try to put it on Hergovic, just didn't really have any success. But in terms of the press release, it says uh, Big David Adelaide is back. 
back in the ring in just over a week in a first defense of his WBO European heavyweight title when he takes on the big hitting Serbian Amir Amatovic on Friday, 9 June at York Hall, live on BT. So big hitting is certainly a stretch. Amatovic is not a puncher from at least what I've seen. The press release says that Amatovic, the man known as Atomic, sees the WBC Mediterranean title with a second round blitz of the 11-1 Hussein Akdemir in Germany. That sounds like a forgettable fight, even just reading it. Three heavyweight fights have been announced for the undercard of George Cambosis versus Maxi Hughes, and that's going to be in July in Oklahoma. So... On one fight, you've got a Jeremiah Milton, a local fighter, still TBA in terms of the opponent, uh, but also you've got Mike Belligan and Hemia Heel added to the card to face each other, and also Ronnie Hines versus um, Belgium's Mikael Perotten. Uh, So both of those guys unbeaten as well. So Hines 12-0-1 and Michael Perotten 7-0. So Hines actually fought uh, Halloween Olguin last time out, got a draw. So in terms of his sort of ceiling, um, if he's losing or drawing with a guy like Olguin, he's probably uh, not going to be too high. But um, against uh, Michael or Mikael Perotten 7-0, maybe this is good matchmaking. Um, Belligan and uh, Heo. So they're coming off some high profile losses recently. So Belligan, he went out to um, Russia, or should I say Armenia, where he fought Murat Gassiev. And it looked like he could have got up. Uh, ultimately, he was blitzed in what was it, a round or two? A round, inside the first round, actually, was it? Uh, and Hemia Heo, he lost to Fainga Opiru last year. He subsequently had a pretty uh, low level tune up comeback fight. But uh, both these guys, uh, from what I understand, both Lou DiBella fighters, so they've been loaned out for this one. And actually, that could be interesting. Both are big punches, but both are hittable and both looking to bounce back after some losses. Identical records as well with uh, 20 and 1 records. Uh, Belligan, slightly higher KO percentage, 16 uh, knockouts to Ahio's 15. So I think someone probably is going to be knocked out. Belligan is, what, bordering on 40 years old now, so perhaps the former football player will actually uh, succumb to the younger uh, heel but then again Belligan is the bigger man and yeah we'll see I mean I quite like it I think that's decent matchmaking we'll see what they do for Milton he's currently 9-0 he needs a little bit of a uh, sort of step up from where he's been fighting just to keep moving him along it says um, in the press release the 29 year old is no stranger to fighting in Oklahoma having fought four times in his hometown of Tulsa Milton is coming off an eight round decision over Fabio Maldonado in April and sometimes it can be hard to look good against Maldonado because he is a bit negative Uh, Jared Anderson he has been uh, spotted working with uh, Roy Jones Jr so we've got Anderson set to face Zan Kosobutsky in about a month so it'll be interesting to see if we see anything uh, he's able to parlay to Anderson sort of uh, come out in his game but uh, yeah Roy Jones Jr at his peak phenomenal fighter um I was going to do a separate video on this, but uh, I decided not to. So we'll just cover a couple of results here. But you've got um, Jose Ladaway. He was facing Ali Kaiden. And as expected, he blew him out, stopped him in the first round of their fight in Germany. This was on a Universum card. So Ladaway is now, what is he, 12-0, something like that, 10-0. They really actually need to, um, 10-0 actually, they need to move him along, get him some better competition because... He needs to step up. He's, you know, not the youngest guy in the world, uh, 33 years old now, 10 and 0. But the, you know, recent fights has just been about the same level of competition. He's ready for a step up. He needs a step up. Otherwise, he's just going to sort of fade into somewhat obscurity. But um, yeah, Jose Ladaway, the Cuban, he's got decent talent. He just basically went out there and just bully boyed um, Ali Kaiden, ultimately landing some shots, a really nice left hook that's um, basically uh, a few shots later, it was all over. And uh, rounding out this uh, best of the week, so you've got the Swedish heavyweight Pesman Saifkani. So he's avenged his uh, only career loss uh, to move to 16-1, and one, uh, avenging the defeat against Awad Tamim. So he won a points decision over eight rounds. What do you make of it all? Drop a comment loud and often. Hit like, hit subscribe, follow me on Twitter, boxing underscore squared. I'm out.